and that these guys are adjoints to the multiplication means that we've got this property here. Uh, in fancy terms, these are partial ordered versions of monoidal, or maybe I should say bi-close categories, because this would be the tensor of the category, which is not necessarily commutative. So that's why we have a left and a right implication. And then uh, pre-groups, though, are partially ordered monoids, where instead of the multiplication having a left and right adjoint, every element of the pre-group has a left and right adjoint. And then you denote those adjoints like this, unary operators. Uh, and then uh, the adjunction inequalities uh, become four inequalities like so. So um, if you multiply the left adjoint of a, uh, of a type P with P from the left, uh, you will less than equal one. And then if you multiply the left adjoint of P with P from the right, you will go above one asymmetrically for the right adjoint. And then these guys then are partial ordered versions of uh, compact white loss categories where again the tensor product here is not necessarily committed. So then, huh, so I thought maybe um, we go through some of the properties of pregroups. So these adjoint uh, operators are um, order reversing, so if P is less than or equal Q, QL will be less than or equal PL, and similarly for the right adjoint. And uh, the opposite adjoints cancel out, so the right adjoint of the left adjoint is of P is equal to P, and the left adjoint of the right adjoint of P is equal to P. And the non-opposite adjoints do not cancel out. So as, uh, as a result of that, you've got uh, iterated adjoints, so I've got P, and it's right adjoint PR, and it's left adjoint PL, and then the right adjoint of PR, PRR, and the left adjoint of PL, PLL, and so on and so forth. So these structures can go uh, forever on the left and on the right. And then multiplication is self-adjoint. So if you take the left or the right adjoint of P multiplied by Q, this will be equal to QL multiplied by PL. Okay, so there is a translation uh, so I must say three groups uh, originated in the work of Lambeck in the 1999. Uh, at the same time, because before he was working with residuated monoids, he also introduced a way of translating an element X of residuated monoid into an element T of X of a pre group as follows. So the unit of the monoid is going to go to the unit of the pre group, and multiplication goes to multiplication. And then if you have uh, an implication, T of A uh, implied B is going to be the right adjoint of T of A multiplied by T of B. And T of backward implication B is T of A multiplied by the left adjoint of T of B. And the intuition here is that these guys are to be thought of semantically as function types. So A is an argument and B is the output, A is the input and B is, is the output. And uh, such a function has to be to the right-hand side of its argument. So that's why here we also got a right adjoint. Whenever we have a right adjoint on a type, it's, it's marking an input to the function. So T of A is the input to this function. And uh, this function has to be to the right-hand side of the TA. And if the mechanism is like so, then you get T of B as the output. Right. right so then... Um, there is a property first time pointed out in this context by Yetter when he was working at algebraic semantics for linear logic in the context of quantiles. So he, he said, he defined uh, a cyclic partially ordered monoid as follows. Uh, a partially ordered monoid is cyclic whenever we have a special element C in the monoid such that for all A and B elements of the monoid, if A multiplied by B is below C, then so will be B multiplied by A. So although the multiplication is not necessarily commutative, you've got a weaker point of commutation if the, multipl the multiplicants are below this special element C. So you cannot in general commute, but if you are below C, you can commute. And then if the partial ordered mind is moreover residuated, then this property becomes uh, equal to this property. Probably you've seen this around, but not this one around. The left and right hand side multiplications by C are equal to each other. Uh, then he also 
define the notion of a, of a dual element, an element D of a residuated noise is dualizing whenever for all A and B, we have that A D forward multiplication by A backward multiplication by D is equal to A and also the other way around. And if the dualizing element is moreover cyclic, then also the same multiplications by D will result in A. Does anybody have a clue what is going on? <laughs> 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 some, some, some. <laughs> so I thought I ought to give some examples. <laughs> okay, so in a resonated lattice monoid, which is something that's also called a quantile, when the lattice is complete, the bottom of the lattice is usually used to define a notion of negation. I think you've all seen this before. So, uh, right implication by bottom gives you a right negation, and left implication by bottom gives you a left negation, and then bottom being cyclic means that the left and the right and negations are the same. So that's what it means. Bottom being dualizing means that uh, the same sign negations cancel out, so left left A is equal to A, right right negation of A is equal to A, what I'm being cyclic and dualizing means that all these negations also cancel out. This translates very before. Mm, right. Okay, so. So these properties hold in residuated monoids, and then I was wondering what can we say about pregroups? So um, it doesn't take a long time to translate these properties using the translation from a residual model into a pregroup and then uh, try to see if those properties hold about them. So it, does, it just turns out that uh, in a pregroup, the unit of the tensor, the unit of the multiplication 1, is dualizing indeed, but it's not necessarily cyclic, in particular if your pregroup um, is proper, it means this is a pregroup and the left and the right adjoints are definitely not the same, then 1 is not going to be a cyclic element. And then using this observation, you can prove a list of very, very nice properties, including these ones. So you can show that in a pregroup, if uh, A times B multiplied B is below 1, then double left adjoint of B multiplied by A is also below 1, and so is uh, B multiplied by double right adjoint of A. So if you are below A, you can commute, but you have to mark your uh, the thing that you move to the double left or double right adjoint. And um, so you can have this property, or dual you can have this property, and then you can think about movement, this sort of movements I was talking about here in the second um, set of properties in a very nice way. So you say if A dot is above 1, then so is B dot AL, which means that you have moved A from the left to the right hand side of B, and you're remembering where did A come from. It came from left, so that's why you have a double left adjunct on it. And similarly for the right one. How is it? Is that if and only if? Is that, is that like a closure? I don't know if I have to check. Right, okay. So how does this relate to linguistics? Alright, so we say Lambert said um, we can define something that's called a pregroup grammar and a pregroup grammar for a language L is a free pregroup T of B freely generated over a set B of basic grammatical types of the language together with a relation normally referred to as a dictionary relation over the vocabulary Z of the language and T of P, so you assign message to each element of the vocabulary to each word of the language, a set of types from this free pre group. And then, for example, then you're, if you are given a string of words uh, of your language, you're going to say that this is a grammatical sentence. Uh, so if you have this string of words, I will want to you and this is going to be a grammatical sentence whenever. For each ti in the dictionary relation d of wi, the multiplication of the t's is below, let's now recall, the designated element s, which in this setting you'll 
stand for that type of sentence. So we've got a very nice uh, algebraic way of thinking about what is grammatical and what's not. So then I am going to try to extend this, so that's what I've been doing in this paper, extend these um, pre-group grammars to pre-cyclic pre-group grammars. I'm going to refer to BAL and BRRA as pre-cyclic permutations of AB, and I'm going to define a pre-cyclic pre-group grammar to be a pre-group grammar with a set of transformations like so. So whenever you have A, let's now recall B, A, B, C, and uh, B, A, L, L is a pre-cyclic permutation of A, B, then you also have this kind of reduction. B, 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 A, L, L, C is above A. And a symmetric one for this. So, moving on. Okay, so um, now some words about Sanskrit. Some, um, so, um, Sanskrit, in fact, was a, it's, it's a very old language. People started talking it in 2000 BC. And the origin of it is in religious text. Uh, Hindi and Vedic hymns. I hope Prakash agrees with me. And then uh, it was not only till 2 to 4 BC that people started to write down the grammar for Sanskrit, uh, which is one of the oldest written grammars in the world. And the guy who did this is called Panini. And somehow. Unfortunately. <laughs> 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 So then, somehow he managed to write down a set of very rigid rules, algebraic-like rules, to describe the grammar. And that's where sometimes Sanskrit is considered to be a language that has a perfect grammar, because of this rigid set of rules. Later in the 19th century, a guy called Apte, whose book is very widely referred to, sort of wrote down, rewrote the grammar of Panini in a way understandable for Europeans. So if you read Apte's book, it's as if you're reading a book, written the same style that a book uh, for a grammar of English has been written. So that's been one of my main references. And in the 20th century, a guy called Starr has a couple of papers and analyzed Sanskrit using course trees, modern terminology. And Brandon Gillen, who is a linguist in McGill University, also has used Chomsky style generative rules and has got so many papers. Well, Sanskrit, one of them was in a leaks workshop in 2003 organized by Phil Scott in Ottawa. Right, okay, so. The basic fragment of Sanskrit, I'm going to consider sentence structure, compounds. Sanskrit is known for having uh, uh, lots of different compounds, 16 different types. So um, uh, I've, only, I've looked at four cases in the paper, and I'm going to quickly show two cases here. It's got a lot of inflections, gender, number, and six cases. So I'm not going to talk about this here uh, if you want to have a look at the paper. And then I'm going to talk about borderline alternation for three cases. Many more are in the paper. Right, so the basic types, we fix the following set of basic types. Pi for object, O for object, P for predicate, N for noun phrase, and S for sentence. And then the general structure of a Sanskrit sentence is as follows. Subject, subject enlargement, verb, object, object enlargement, and adverb. Uh, so if you don't assign the type pi to the subject, because the subject enlargement is to the right hand side, of the subject and modifies it, we're going to assign the type pi r pi to it, but then the subject will be first fed to subject enlargement, and then the result of this is going to be fed to the verb which has the type pi r s o l, o l standing for the object. So um, then the object is also going to be fed to the object enlargement, etc. etc. At the end, the s that comes out here is going to be fed to the adverb, which is going to modify it and produce the final result. And here is an example. So Rama from the old city, that's the enlargement. Saw so, Subhadra, the beautiful woman, which is a high place. So, so, um, um, so for the rest of the talk, is two more parts of the slides. So I've only considered the, uh, the case of transitive sentences, copular sentences when you have the verb to be. Uh, actually, very nicely, the Sanskrit in Sanskrit is aste, which is like the grandmother of the verb to be in French. And Spanish. So that's one of the signs people use to say if a language is Indo European or not. So, so I'm not going to. So if you have a copula or verb, the, cannot, the sentence structure is not like this, but I'm not going to talk about this here. If you want to see the paper. What do you think, Prakash? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great sentence. <laughs> 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 I like the front. 
from the old city part. Okay, so let me skip the compound in the interest of time and do the word order. All right, so stall made the so uh, stall case is something that's called an agglutinative language because of the cases that attach themselves to the end of the word. So no matter where your subject and object are in the sentence, you know that this is subject and this is an object, something that doesn't happen in English. So people sometimes argue word order doesn't matter in Sanskrit because wherever it is, it's marked, your subject and your object, and you know where it is, what it is. So um, Stahl was one of the first people who said this is absolutely not true, and word order is only free among the branches of the same constituent. So now, for example, if you have a sentence like Rama Apasyat Govindam, which is Rama saw Govindam, although this H and the M are uh, the cases, in this case nominative and dative, and you know that Rama is the subject and Govindam is the object, not all permutations are possible. Normally you have six possible permutations, but only four of them are allowed. <coughs> Why? Because Rama is one constituent, Apasyat Govindam is the second constituent, Rama can go from before this constituent to after it, and Apasyat and Govinda can also permute between themselves, but it's never the case that Rama can actually insert itself between these two things, for example. So, um, we can reason about this kind of things in this pre-cyclic pre-group grammars. All you have to do is to add uh, the permutations that formalize this kind of constraints. In this case, for example, we have something that says Hyares, uh, has a cyclic permutation uh, which will give you S by L, what this is saying is that the subject can move from before the verb to after it. So when, uh, if, if, it had the pi, if it had the corresponding type pi R in the verb, now it can have the corresponding type pi L. Similarly, this one says the object that can be after the verb now can move to before it. Yeah, so as a result of these things, if you have a sentence like this, Rama Govindam Apasya, where Govindam moves from here, Apasya and Govindam change place, so Govindam moves from here to here, then if you put the original type of the verb, you'll see that phi O, phi R as well, is not going to reduce to anything tangible, because phi R has to cancel out with a pi, whereas it has O before it. So then if we apply the transformation that corresponds to this RR permutation, it can be uh, written down as pi o o r pi r s, which then cancel out the type s. And similarly for another permutation. Right. Okay. So uh, finally, um, Brendan Gillan did something extremely interesting. He made a corpus of all religious Sanskrit texts available together with all the examples of Apte, which were more in a modern. Uh, setting, and then he started to read them and realized that uh, Stahl's uh, constraints are not always true. It's true that those kind of permutations occur in small sentences, like three word transitive sentences, but as the sentence grows, you, you will in fact see um, movements that uh, are considered unlawful by Stahl's constraints. So he then went to study this kind of uh, word order alternations. There's five types which I discussed in length in the paper. Uh, so this is one example. Mm, so you can see here that if you have the center Rama from the old city, Apasya Sao Govindam, although Rama and from the old city form one constituent, and it will never be the case according to Stahl that Rama can move from the beginning of the sentence to the end of it because you cannot take two constituent things apart from each other. But indeed, in the, in the corpus, Gillan observed that you can have a sentence like this, in fact, more than a considerable amount of times. So then, um, so then I was showing that if you have these things, then you can add appropriate um, uh, permutations, fear and the corresponding transformations, and indeed you can also parse sentences of this type. Okay. Sorry, you, it comes like this, isn't it like... Uh, Rama was seeing this woman while she was being in the city, whereas the other one is that Rama is actually in the city. Which one is one? In the second one, it's like... Uh, you say this has, this has a different meaning than this one. Well, I don't speak Sanskrit. But... <laughs> no, no, they do have different meanings. It, does, it also happens in English. For example, you can say, uh, he must love her. And then you can say, her he must love. Of course, the semantic meaning of the second one is different. You, you bring 
the object in the beginning to put some emphasis. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's it. And um, I was thinking maybe I can do some future work for Professor's next test trip in 10 years or something. Thirty. <laughs> <laughs> and work out some sequel couples to automatically reset about these things. Sanskrit is complete <laughs> in a complexity sense. So you, you mentioned Indo-European languages. Is there a way in which you can, uh, uh, you know, um, deform or evolve your set of grammars along the phylogeny of all the languages, or do you have completely different grammars for French, Italian, Persian, German? Uh, is there so a family? Mm -hmm. These are all in the European, the ones that you mentioned. So in yeah, the yeah, that's what I'm asking. So what is the difference between the grammatical structure? So we think of them as a derivative of a common root language, right? So I'm asking whether you can actually um, write grammars that will somehow follow this um, stream of modification in your language of grammars. Oh, so there is an idea of. Um, being able to write a universal grammar, which people then assign to a language which didn't exist, so it's called Cotton European. And then there are conjectures that all these other European languages sort of are derived from this. So maybe if one writes a grammar in a universal grammar, then you can say some meaning to things about how each grammar changed, why French became French. It would be like a two-categorical right. approach to the Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 we talking about how it works. Yes, yes. I was going to do some work about Persian, old Persian, modern Persian. Well, I'm interested because uh, I could never be explained the grammar properly. And how about what is hell to an algebra of life? Doesn't help that you have to say. How does the detractive computing meaning? Okay, thank you so much for asking. <laughs> also, I was going to say at the beginning, but I forgot. So, if we, so these things we've been doing, doing vector spaces and fancy diagrams and compact closed stuff, but you always have to build it on a, a corpus that is grammatically parsed. So, if you want to calculate your meaning according to the ways that we have been doing, you have to have a pre-group grammar first to start with, so that's how it helps. I was actually thinking maybe like we can look at the corpus of Sanskrit Pilan has built and think about meaning using vector spaces there. Is that what you are asking? Why? Because you said the meaning changed if you put the words from the vector spaces. Yes, forms. yeah, I don't know how to do that. Uh, so, it, so it changes meaning, yeah. It's just about emphasis, so I don't know how to put on to emphasis in the vector system. More questions? If not, then let's thank you.